Ladies and gentlemen, like all the Twitter, ladies and gentlemen, anybody, anybody that's not using the video camera. All right. Please take your seats as the program is about to begin. Tell me when. Because that's what they usually do anytime the governor's here or anybody comes around.
so I guess we have one. I'm going to off-center just a hair here. Please do. These are a little bit better, I think, because then we can have yeah. them shoot down that way and shoot this way. I'll say left and right of the stage. And I'm going to have... Who, what are you doing during the question and answer? You're tweeting. I'm going to tweet. Okay. We're still going to do line tweeting. I'm going to tweet them still. That's okay. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to the third Congressional District Town Hall and State of the District Town Hall meeting. Please join me in welcoming our host, Dr. David Harrison, President of Columbus State Community College, to welcome us to his institution. Dr. David Harrison. While we're waiting for Dr. Harrison to make it to the stage, please put your hands together for Mr. Byron Stripling and his trio from the Columbus Jazz Orchestra, providing us with wonderful sounds, fantastic music during this third congressional district, state of the district and town hall meeting. We'll be right back.
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Dr. David Harrison, President of Columbus State Community College, to welcome us to his institution. Dr. Harrison will be followed by Bishop Jerome H. Ross for the invocation, and then please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Dr. Harrison. Thank you for that. We didn't rehearse this, um, so I apologize if uh, I got the choreography wrong a little bit. Uh, we're delighted to have you here tonight. It's a big deal uh, for us to host this. Uh, some of you probably haven't been to Columbus State before, and you should know that uh, this is one of the largest and most comprehensive community colleges in America. We serve more than 25,000 students from around the state, but most of them are from right here in the third district. So having Congresswoman Beatty uh, have her state of the district uh, speech here tonight uh, is a big deal for us. And I know we've got some students here uh, and it's an honor for them uh, to be exposed to this. Uh, a lot of folks don't realize the, uh, the role that the federal government uh, plays uh, in community college education. A very high percentage of our students uh, are on need-based aid, uh, almost all of which comes uh, through the Pell program uh, through the federal government. Um, and we've been the recipient of grants from the Department of Labor, um, which has really uh, put us in a leadership position uh, in logistics uh, and other fields. And nobody understands the role uh, of government and the way that uh, the federal government can help uh, promote education and workforce development in our region, like Joyce Beatty. Uh, and uh, we feel very confident uh, that uh, our district is in good hands with Congresswoman Beatty there. Um, and she is, uh, uh, she and I share a mentor from our Dayton days. Um, and I know that uh, having her a phone call away uh, is, uh, is a big asset for me as president. But I also know that probably everybody in this room has that same relationship with Congresswoman Beatty. So it's our uh, privilege uh, to, to host tonight. And we're proud to be here. Welcome. May we have Bishop Jerome H. Ross to the podium for the invocation, please. Shall we pray? Eternal and all wise God, it is into thy presence we now come we come with thanksgiving in our hearts for all of your blessings. We're so mindful that you've been good to us. You've blessed us beyond measure. Allow us to thank you for this day and what this day has already given unto us. And as we come, we seek your direction and your guidance. We pray for those who lead us. We pray especially for our president. And we pray for she who leads us in Congress. We pray that thou would fill her mouth with words of wisdom, that thou would give her great insight and a heart full of compassion. And then God, as we come tonight we ask that thou would bless these proceedings that you get glory and you get honor we thank you and it's in your name we pray jesus christ our lord amen thank you bishop ross ladies and gentlemen please stand and join me in welcoming boy scout troop 826 from reynoldsburg ohio for the presentation of the flags and the pledge of allegiance
And joining Boy Scout Troop 826 for the Pledge of Allegiance is Caleb Harper of Columbus. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now for our national anthem. Joining Congresswoman Joyce Betty on the stage are elected officials who represent the partnership that is being formed in the 3rd Congressional District, regardless of whether it's urban or suburban, and between local, state, and federal government. Please welcome Franklin County Commissioner Paula Brooks. <laughs> Brooks will have some words for us right now. First of all, I would like to congratulate Congresswoman Beatty on a wonderful, wonderful year, and we look forward to many more years of her terms. Terms, plural. She Isn't she the best Congresswoman in the United States? And it's my pleasure to be here tonight, uh, a day after I received a wonderful email, the first person to call me on my appointment to President Obama's task force on climate change preparedness and resilience was our Honorable Joyce Beatty. She was the first person to say to me how important this work is in looking at sustainability and how sustainability can mean jobs in all of our communities throughout Ohio and our nation. So I look forward uh, to working very, very closely with Com Congresswoman Beatty and her office as we prepare our report uh, on Ohio's portion of the President's task force. And that will be done at the end of this summer. And I ask for all of your input uh, so that we can do the best job possible for our President of the United States. And also, that report will be provided to the Congress members, uh, staff, and office. And we, again, know that we're all Franklin County, we're all Ohio, and we're all America. So, Joyce, congratulations on a great first year. We love you. Thanks. Also joining Congresswoman Beatty for the State of the District and Town Hall is Bexley Mayor Ben Kessler, representing the suburban mayors within the 3rd Congressional District. Thank you all of you. Thank you, Congresswoman Beatty. I am Mayor Ben Kessler. That's mayor with a lowercase m as opposed to mayor with an uppercase <laughs> m right over here. So. Bexley, I have some news for you about Bexley. Bexley is a 
at the center of the universe. That's right, center of the universe, and I want to explain to you why that is. We all know Ohio is the heart of it all, correct? Right? We know Columbus is at the heart of Ohio, right? We know that Bexley is almost right there in the center of Columbus. Okay, not quite the center of the universe, almost. What we're aware of though, keenly aware of, is that we survive only because we have each other. Uh, we survive because of partnership. That no matter how nice we make our own little uh, section of the world or of the district or whatever section we have, that section is nothing without neighbors and partners and those around us. So tonight we're really celebrating partnership. We're celebrating this district. And we're appreciating and enjoying the symbiotic relationship that we have with each other. Every day, every leader in this room wakes up driven by one common vision and goal, and that is to improve this district, to improve the stakeholders in it. Day by day, week by week, month by month, we hone, we tweak, we make little changes, all with that central, united goal to constantly improve this fantastic Columbus experience. So thank you, Congresswoman Beatty, for your leadership, for bringing us together today, and for helping us advance this common vision for an, a district that collectively is the premier center, the best place to live, and to enjoy culture, art, commerce, and education. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Also joining us is the mayor of this great city of Columbus, Mayor Michael B. Coleman. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Now, you know it's cold outside, but we've all gathered here today to stay warm and to get heated up and inspired by Congresswoman Joyce Beatty. She's my congresswoman. She's everybody's congresswoman. I am so proud of this woman. She is my friend. I love her to death. And you know, um, I am not a fan of Congress. I'll say it again. I am not a fan of Congress. Congress is polarized. They're focused on philosophy, ideology, unable to agree where to go to lunch in the afternoon. <laughs> they don't come together. But there are those exceptions in Congress that make a difference. Because we have a voice with Joyce in Congress. <laughs> Congresswoman Beatty is inspiring. She gets things done. She works with her constituents. She calls me at 11 o'clock on Saturday evening about all kinds of stuff. Never stops working. She reaches across the aisle in a bipartisan way. And the way that should work in Congress is people should come together to help solve tough problems. That's why we sent her there. And that is what she is doing for Columbus. So just a few weeks back, she worked with uh, Senator Rob Portman to introduce a bipartisan piece of legislation to protect uh, missing and exploited children in the United States, the Bringing Miss Missing Children Home Act of 2014. Thank you, Joyce. A voice with Joyce. She's a team player. On Tuesday night, I sat down to watch the president give a state of the nation. And who did I see? <laughs> a voice with Joyce. <laughs> whispering in the president's ear, don't forget to say this, do that. That's the kind of woman we have here today. She will work hard on behalf of the third district. And yes, that does include Baxley. 
I think it includes Reynoldsburg as well, doesn't it? Yes. Yes? Yes. And most of Columbus, she's making a difference to all of us. And I'm grateful that she is serving in that capacity. My friend, Congresswoman Joyce Beatty, we love you. Thank, Thank you. you. Ladies and gentlemen, please turn your attention to the video screen for a year in review in the 3rd Congressional District with Congresswoman Joyce Beatty. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the inaugural Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the inaugural State of the District celebration right here at Columbus State Community College. Congresswoman Joyce Beatty has been simply brilliant representing the 3rd Congressional District in the House of Representatives of the 113th Congress. It's been a wonderful year. Let's take a look from the beginning. Congresswoman Joyce Beatty was sworn into the 113th Congress as a member of the House of Representatives on January 3, 2013. Now, as a member, Congresswoman Beatty pledges to work in a bipartisan fashion. She worked hard to change the perception of Congress. Congresswoman Beatty played softball and tennis during charity events, raising money for after-school programs for children and fundraising for cancer research. She also promoted the When Women Succeed, America Succeeds campaign here in Columbus at the King Arts Complex. With Congresswoman Beatty leading that effort. One of her first official acts was to oversee the Ohio Electoral College for President Obama's second term. Women in our country continue to overcome obstacles and excel to greatness. Then she got down to business, representing the community she serves, representing the 3rd Congressional District in the community, the nation, and the world. It seemed as though Congresswoman Beatty was everywhere, meeting constituents, standing with friends and supporters, or appearing at speaking engagements and personal appearances. She made many appearances with fellow members of Congress. Congresswoman Beatty became adept at her new job with ease and excellence. My Republican colleagues, citizens want us united. They want compromise, not to be shut down. Joyce took time to celebrate the historic 50th anniversary of the March on Washington. Then the Congresswoman dove deeper into her work. She supported several initiatives and was appointed to two House committees. Congresswoman Beatty became one of the chicest ladies in the House. Congresswoman Beatty has been spotted with the Vice President at the State of the Union Address and even Air Force One. Does Joyce have White House aspirations? I must say, Congresswoman Beatty has been a wonderful representative for this district in Congress. Ladies and gentlemen, please put... Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to and that the voice inaugural was State of the Ron, District Show. And that voice was Ron Bryant. Thank you so very much. Good evening. Thank you for joining me for my inaugural State of the District Town Hall meeting. And thank you, Dr. Harrison, for hosting us in this wonderful facility. County Commissioner Paula Bryant, Paula Brooks, Appointee for Climate Preparedness for Ohio. I like to say my appointee. <laughs> Appointed by the President of these United States, Paula Brooks. <laughs> to Mayor Kessler, to Mayor Coleman with the little M and the big M's. <laughs> Thank you for your leadership. Thank you all for being supporters of the 3rd Congressional District. Thank you, Mayor Coleman, for giving me that voice and opportunity to work with you and the other citizens in this wonderful community that we live in. I would also like to introduce my unconditional supporters, my family. First, my husband, Otto. 
Thank you for being my partner. Thank you for always being there. I love you. To the rest of my family who are here, Laurel and Richard and Christy, and in my script, of course, I said the most important person in our family, and that's my granddaughter, Leah. But the joke's on them. You saw her in the video. <laughs> Thank you so much. Serving Ohio's third congressional district in Congress is both an honor and a privilege. As you just witnessed in the video, I have had a fast-paced, full first year. I have established a solid working relationship with diverse stakeholders through extensive outreach, partnerships, and an incredible staff team. Please join me in welcoming and recognizing my congressional staff. And all of the volunteers and organizations who are here, let me give you a heartfelt thank you for all that you have done to make tonight possible. My cabinet team, Kimberly Ross, Chief of Staff and Legal Counsel. <laughs> Greg Beswick, District Director and Communication Director. <laughs> Attorney Jennifer Storypan, Legislative Director. Ron McGuire, Outreach Director. <laughs> I would also like to recognize all elected officials past and current, would you please stand and be recognized? <laughs> Since I was sworn in just 12 months ago, a lot has happened. But I want you to know that I have worked hard to deliver on my promise that I would be that voice in Congress, Mayor Coleman, that I would be a new voice in Congress. I want you to know that I believe I have not only been a new voice, but I have been a strong voice. I have been a strong voice for jobs, health care, housing, education, for our seniors and veterans, and for women. We know when women succeed, America succeeds. This evening's message is not only about capturing my first year's journey, it's about creating a wave of hope, a wave that ripples so high that it will instill a belief that if we work together, we can fill in the blanks with democracy. We can fill the blanks in with hope and compromise that will lead us to a path of stability in our economy, a more inclusive healthcare marketplace, a renewed head start for preschoolers, for affordable healthcare and a quality education system, a safe environment, and a place we call home that protects our allies. On January the 3rd, I was sworn into Congress to the most diverse class in the history of Congress. Proudly, I stood on the steps with my 90 colleagues, Democrats and Republicans, and I stood there as the only African-American female in my class. <laughs> I was appointed to serve on the prestigious House Financial Services Committee. In my first year on the committee, I have had the fortune enough to have legislative language to be put into a bill, to be able to amend a bill that not only unanimously passes out of the House committee, but goes to the floor and makes a partisan bill a bipartisan bill and received 391 votes on the House floor. 
This initial success has galvanized the real reason I wanted to go to Congress, to be able to go there and to serve on this committee so we could have some common sense language put into legislation on financial services, financial issues, and housing, not only for our consumers, but for our consumers and investors alike. You see, I have participated in 32 official financial service committee meetings and subcommittees, debating some of the most critical and important issues to sustain the nation's financial stability. I have had the unique opportunity to hear testimony and to pose questions to some of the most powerful and brilliant minds on financial services in this country. Secretary of Treasury, Jacob Liu, Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke, and our very own Richard Cordray of the Consumers Financial Protection Bureau. Central Ohio has some 120,000 jobs tied directly to financial services. So what a better committee to serve on than this committee that oversees what goes on in the industry. But I have not limited my work to financial services only, in part because of you, my constituents. You have fueled me with the support, giving me the energy to serve and represent you on diverse issues, with the expectation that I would come back here and stand with you and share with you what I have done. Well, tonight, my constituents, I'm here and I stand with you. Citizens also want to make sure that we work together, creating actions that provide a voice of breakthrough in partisan politics. In that bipartisan spirit, I am the Democratic co-sponsor on the National Collegiate Athletics Accountability Act, or the NCAA, a bill that ensures students participating in contact sports receive health checks to keep them safe and to keep their scholarships and to protect them of their due process if they get in trouble. Further, I spearheaded legislation on, con on concussion research to protect our youth. And I am proud to be joined by my legislative Republican Congresswoman Ann Wagner and Congressman Charlie Dent. I have introduced the new House Act at legislation which allows federal funds to flow to organizations and entrepreneurs to make a commitment to reinvest in our communities and our neighborhoods. And most recently, as the mayor shared with you, I have introduced the bipartisan, bicameral child sex trafficking bill, the Bringing Missing Children's Home Act of 2014. And I've done that with Senator Portman. I am so invested in this bill that I believe that it will be our amber alert of sex trafficking for our children. Thanks so much to the leaders in our community, like community activist Sally Gibson, like Reynoldsburg Councilman Cornelius Grady, and like Columbus City Schools coordinator for Stories Behind Their Eyes, Darlita Jones, for their advocacy against child sex trafficking. <laughs> A frequent question that's asked to me is what is it like to be in Congress? And is it really as bad as it looks on TV? <laughs> Well, we have had some knock-down, drag-out fights. We have had some mean-spirited debates. But on some of the days, we realize that we must work together to get something done. So there are some issues, there are some days, and there are some delegations and some caucuses that really do get together to try to make a difference. And that's why I have introduced 11 pieces of legislation and co-sponsored 206 bills. And I've only been there one year. Now, unfortunately, 
In my first year in Congress, it also brought the first time of a government shutdown since 1996. During those 16 days of government shutdown, there were some very, very tough votes. Piecemeal budget votes, picking winners and losers. For example, proposing legislation that would make you pick between funding a cancer research program for six-year-olds six or providing services to veterans. I decided that I would not participate in that game. And you know why? That's like telling parents with four children to pick two children to starve and two children to feed. I would not pick winners and losers. But I can tell you, I was very pleased to join the bipartisan vote that opened government back up and allowed hundreds and hundreds of thousands of federal workers to go back to work and to give you, the American people, the fully functioning government that you deserve. And just hours before the government shut down, I had the great honor to go over and greet 80 Ohio veterans, all from our communities, at the World War II Memorial in D.C. for their Saturday morning honors flight in. I salute them and thank them for their work. And now let me share, nine million Americans have newfound health security this year, and million more stand to gain from the quality, affordable coverage that it provides. And tonight, tonight is more than a speech from a podium. It's about sharing how my office serves you. My office has served thousands of constituents on case, service, case management services from federal agencies, including the Veterans Affairs Support Services, Social Security, IRS, Medicare, and immigration, including some 30,000 pieces of constituents' correspondence and responding to over 10,000 phone calls from constituents. And we have successfully closed out 72% of all our cases. We issued hundreds of congressional proclamations to recognize people in our district for their exemplary achievements. And we have also accommodated some 500 requests for tours and 125 of them at the United States Capitol. I have held three teletown halls, including the Rise Up for Justice Voter Rights Telethon, which provides you an opportunity to talk to me directly on issues. I personally met with some 200 groups, and my staff has taken over 1,000 meetings from constituents, elected officials, university presidents, bank presidents, CEOs from corporate American, and little Miss Jane that lives on the corner. <laughs> they have met with all types of stakeholders, and I have had the opportunity to meet with the president of Somalia and the Israeli ambassador to the United States. I have continued my job tour across the district that has allowed me to visit many of you and your employers, trade associations, organizations involved in the so much needed workforce development. And guess what? I flipped hamburgers at White Castle <laughs> during their National Hamburger Week. And I will tell you, it is not as easy as it looks. <laughs> so when you get a response from my office and they tell you that I can't make it to your event on that special day, just know that I am somewhere in the district representing you. And the question you should ask is why is it so important for us to have constituent services? Well, how about this for an answer? My office has successfully secured nearly 
one million dollars. Yes, one million dollars for constituents in payments due to them from the federal government by advocating on their behalf with responsible federal agency. Now that deserves an applause. We have had the opportunity to do great things for our youth. In our district, we have participated in the arts competition. Every member of Congress hosts an art competition. Our art competition attracted 45 very talented students from 14 different high schools throughout the third congressional district. Our 2013 winner is Damon Dillard, Jr a senior at Marion Franklin High School. And our 2014 winner will be announced on April 24th at a joint congressional reception, first time ever, at our very own nationally recognized Columbus Museum of the Arts. And it will be chaired by the Columbus chapter of the Lynx Incorporated. I have celebrated many historical events and anniversaries. From having a ringside seat at the president's inaugural address, rubbing the lipstick off his face <laughs> at his inaugural State of the Union address last year. And this year, I was able to submit a phrase that I wanted him to include in his speech. 24 hours before the president's speech of these United States in a meeting with our leadership, Leader Pelosi and White House staff, I decided I'd use that voice. And I took the chance to ask them to ask him. Do you know how proud I was when the president said, when women succeed, America succeeds. That was my phrase. And yes, I know what you're thinking. I have been to the White House and attended programs with First Lady Michelle Obama. <laughs> and I've even been in the West Wing. So I can tell you with these experiences, I am happy, but we have a lot of work to do. Looking ahead to 2014, I am very optimistic. Although guardedly optimistic, I propose to do my share to help move America forward. We must start by opening doors of opportunity for all our children. I believe education and workforce development is where we will gain the best compromise from the majority. Education is our best chance for bipartisanship work. It will make the state of our union so much stronger. A child's education provides the greatest hope for success and demands our full attention. Learning brings skills, skills brings jobs, and jobs bring stability and growth. So here's my direction. Working on the expansion of pre-kindergarten programs, STEM, and a affordable higher education, saving our children by protecting them for the future. By concussion awareness, the bill that will serve children 7 to 21 years old. A comprehensive tax reform that encourages job creation and helps bring down the deficit. Introducing bipartisan legislation that will benefit area businesses headquartered and conducting business in the 3rd Congressional District. Holding my first 3rd Congressional District Day in Washington, D.C., and everybody's invited to attend. <laughs> Advocating for one of our most precious rights, voters' rights making sure that we have equal rights for everyone. And of course, expanding when women succeed, America succeeds. And lastly, 
increasing economic development, continuing to support and create more jobs large for large and small businesses, like Robert Lee's Tim Horton on Livingston Avenue, Garcia, Jack, and Benny's Family Restaurant, and Jenny's Ice Cream Store. You see, it's important to support businesses, and it's equally important for us to do business in America. It is the collective efforts that make a difference for us. And lastly, let me tell you this story. A little boy by the name of Chris Street gave a message to his mother. He said, mother, will you call the congresswoman and ask her if she will come to my school so the students in my school will have a better understanding of our civic duties. Well, Chris Street, I'm coming to your school. And there's a young lady in the audience tonight with her parents. I'm gonna ask her to stand. She went through a process and she wanted to go to West Point. Do you know how difficult it is to go to West Point? Where is Mary, where is she? Stand up. I want you to look at this young lady that has achieved so much and she's our appointee and she's finding out tonight for the first time you have been accepted to West Point. Mary Hunger. I would say I've been busy. So let me conclude with this part by saying, it is the collective efforts of our entire community that makes the third congressional district a wonderful place to live and a wonderful place to represent. With that, I would like to recognize individuals and organizations that are making a difference in the third congressional district. For those of you who remember and know and witness me when I served in the Ohio House of Representatives, you know I like awards and recognitions. So this is my first time to be able to say thank you to everyone but for the five categories that will receive our very first inaugural State of the District recognitions, I am pleased to announce them tonight. In arts in the community, arts play an extremely important role in our society in expressing who we are and what we stand for in this community. I want to recognize two institutions from the 3rd Congressional District. First, to the King Arts Complex. The Martin Luther King Arts Complex has educated our community and African American artists and arts for decades. On the grounds is the Mamie Moore Park, the Beatty Gazebo. I have held many functions there while trying to make a difference. And I'm proud to announce tonight, we will hold on your grounds when women succeeds, America succeeds this summer. <laughs> to the executive director and CEO, Demetrius Neely, I present to you this recognition. and no stranger to the arts. Last year, I had one of the greatest honors of my term. I had the honor of helping the mayor and other e officials surprise you <laughs> by announcing that our very own Columbus Museum of the Arts would be awarded the Institute of Museum and Library Services National Medal of Excellence. It did not stop there. With that, we actually got to go to the White House. It didn't stop there. We took a young student with us. And that student and our recipient tonight 
had the great honor of joining on stage with Nanette and First Lady Michelle Obama to receive the award. So let me present to you Nanette Aisha Jones from the Columbus Museum of Art this recognition. Thank you. Jerry. Thank you. Workforce development. Sheet metals workers local 24. Sheet metal workers of local 24 and I have gotten to know each other quite well since I started my congressional journey. Their leaders and memberships invited me to their training facility. I thought I would be there for a few minutes and get the traditional spiel. Let me tell you, what a tour, what an organization. Labor union individuals who get it. They were about jobs, they were about partnerships, and they were about making our community safer. They are accomplishing this by making changes to the codes at all levels to make sure they provide their members with continuing education and certification. So to my new good friends, Scott Hammond, Jeff Rush, Rodney French, and all the members of the Sheet Workers Metal Lo Metal Local of 24, please join us on stage. So they're gonna let us do this. Columbus Urban League. The Columbus Urban League provides workforce development through training, counseling, and empowerment. Their program helps prepare workers across the spectrum, counseling un- and underemployed workers. Their boot camps and summer camps for youth programs empowers individuals and prepares them for the place of work. To CEO and President Stephanie Hightower, it is my honor. I've had the honor to work with you. I've had the honor to serve on the Urban League's board. But tonight is my greatest honor to say, girlfriend, job well done. Education to our youth one of my platforms, Columbus International High School. Columbus International High School is helping to make Columbus increasingly relevant in an increasing global society. The students at Columbus International School, in their words, blew me away. I walked into the school and I was greeted by students who said hello to me in five different languages. They escorted me to the first room and I knew I needed to ask for a translator <laughs> because everyone was speaking every and any language imaginable. And then I met this soldier, their principal. What an experience with talented students. It is my honor to present this school, one of our recognitions, and for me to stand with Principal Amir Kim El Malwani. Thank you. you have students here. And I heard some of the students are here. Would you please stand? Thank you. To the Reynoldsburg East M Academy, as a member of the Ohio General Assembly, I cast the deciding vote to help bring STEM education to Ohio. Seeing schools develop like the Reynoldsburg East STEM School is quite amazing and very rewarding for me. It lets me know that our mutual work makes a difference. And this is why you can never, never give up on our children and our schools. So let me say it is my pleasure to present to you the first STEM competition model, modeled after the arts competition. Thank you to Principal Marcy Ramey, who is uh, not here today. She's here. Okay. She's in the back. Where is Marcy? Okay, there you are. 
Thank you. Please give her an applause. Thank you, Scott Bennett. Community reinvestment, Homeport. New name, same great service. Homeport is an agency in the third congressional district that focuses on increasing economic literacy and access to affordable housing, something very near and dear to my heart. I've had the opportunity to work with them over the last 20 plus years making a difference in the lives of individuals in our community. Please join me in saluting their president and CEO, Amy Claven, and her guests. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Huntington Bank might sound unusual at first, Huntington has been a member of the Central Ohio business community for decades. I am sure many of you have partnered with them on one project or two projects or three projects, and it probably could go on and on. I know I have. Huntington has been a leader in the community reinvestment both here and across the state. They have set the bar nationally. When I mentioned that this award was going to Huntington in another city, a bank president came up to me and said, you made the right decision for this. It is so important for us to understand that they set the bar for not only doing what they do every day in the banking business, but for making sure that our communities benefit from their investment, they're involved in affordable housing, and they have been committed to financial literacy. And I know that that is something that you know that is very dear to my heart. They have also worked with Money Matters programs with the St. Stephen's Community Center and the Jewish Family Services. According to the Federal Home Bank Loan President, Andrew Howe, Andrew said, Huntington Bank is an exemplary affordable housing partner. Huntington effectively le leverages Federal Home Bank loans, grants, with other private and public resources to achieve both capacity and high quality affordable housing in all of the community it serves. Jim Clunk, a long friend of Huntington Bank's Central Ohio Regional President, join me in saluting him. Thank you. Mid Ohio Food Bank. We all understand that to be a productive student, a worker, a ma, a dad, a neighbor, or a citizen. We can't be hungry at the beginning of the day every day. And that is why I want to recognize the Ohio, the Mid-Ohio Food Bank in my inaugural state of the district. Prior to taking this office, I had an opportunity to tour your facility. I am so proud that I was able to stay there all day looking at the initiatives and rolling up my sleeve and in some small way helping to make a difference. So it is my honor to present to you on behalf of the 3rd Congressional District to Matt Hafish and his representatives. And last but not least, service to our nation. The last two recognitions I would like to give out are to two residents of the 3rd Congressional District who have served our nation. Dorothy Cage Evans, first Dorothy Cage Evans, has been an active member in our community helping to fund the Greater Columbus Community Helping Hands Project, providing support and services to enhance youth services, self-esteem, life skills, and making sure that they would find their way. For that, she was applauded by so many people. But let me just tell you, 
volunteer, longtime worker for years at the Defense Supply Center, Greater Columbus. Her efforts there as an employee by directing the U.S. Savings Bond Campaign and Operation Feed. Her campaigns reached the highest participation in that agency and landed her the Defense Logistic Agency Land and Maritime Hall of Fame Award. It is my honor to present our individual award to Dorothy Cage Evans, my friend, and I am honored to ask also, is Hank with me? To ask her partner, Hank Evans, to please stand. Thank you. Thank you. And now, one of the best parts of being a member of Congress is my ability to help constituents navigate the federal government. Veterans work with our office to gain access to benefits, to loans and medals. As you know, medals are given for valor serving our country. Earlier this year, we were able to successfully assist the third congressional district resident and World War II veteran, Lawrence Crowder, obtain his medals from the federal government, from Washington, D.C. And I have to read this because I want to get it right and not get emotional. Marksman's badge with rifle bar, honorable service lapel button, World War II, World War II Victor Medal, and European African Middle Eastern Campaign Medal with one silver star. It is my honor to stand on this stage with you and say when I went to Washington and the federal government and we had the honor to find out what you have done to serve your country, it was my honor to sign my name on that letter. But it is a greater honor to say from the federal government, I have your medals tonight. And we present them to you. Is your wife here? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Is that Ms. Crowder, your wife? Yes. Yeah. And Mrs. Crowder is also here. Mrs. Crowder, thank you as well. Thank you. Our work is not always easy, but as you can see, it can be done. Let's give them all another round of applause. And let's also thank my colleagues and Dr. Harrison. We will now move directly into the question and answer period. We have seats for any of you down here if you would like to stay. As we start our first town hall question period, please notice that there are microphones in the aisle. So what we're gonna do is ask you, if you have a question, to please line up at the microphone. We would like to have five people at a time, and as time permits, we may increase those numbers. As you approach the microphone to ask a question, we ask that you tell us your name and where you are from in the district. Do we have a question at the first microphone? Okay, I, I, okay my name is uh, Dr. Christine Cheriton, and I live in Blacklick, Ohio. I'm a faculty member at Ohio State, and I'm a psychologist. And um, my question, um, well, I wanted to say my husband was here and we had a protest banner and a flag, but we weren't allowed to keep it here. And it's about Ukraine right now. There are serious uh, human rights violations. 
And um, I went in, I, I'm interested in if you would be willing to be a sponsor for a bill for bipartisan support to help the people of Ukraine. Uh, people are dying. I have literature here. I have my business card and information. Thank you so much for that question. And let me give you the response that we probably have one of the most open door offices. I have a legislative director that's here tonight. And what we do with the process for every request that we get, we actually read it in our legislative unit and they actually bring it to me. And every request that I get like that, I go through it, through it, and we'll read it, and then we will give you an answer back. It's too difficult for me to stand here blindly, but, but I look forward to the opportunity. Exactly. No, I'm, I'm very clear in understanding it, and we will look at it. I just don't want to say without having a letter in front of me of the actual language, if I can sign it. But it is something we are very interested in and would want to be a bipartisan supporter. Thank you. Next question. Oh, we have another microphone over here. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, Gail Thomas, I'm with the Alzheimer's Association, and uh, I have to add one more kudo to Congresswoman Beatty's uh, record this year. We asked her and she immediately signed up on the uh, Congressional Task Force for Alzheimer's. We asked her one time and she did it. She was one of the ones who voted for the groundbreaking bipartisan um, budget year this year that gave $122 million extra for research on Alzheimer's. It was a hard fought battle and she stuck in there. And she, was all, she is also one of the co-sponsors of something called the HOPE Act, which is to uh, promote early detection. And it is one of the kinds of acts that will make a difference in the long time, long term uh, journey with Alzheimer's. So she needs a lot of kudos for that because it's really hard to get sponsors for uh, Alzheimer's programs. My question is, how do we get her colleagues here in Central Ohio to join her in these efforts? First, let me just say thank you, and I can't take all of that credit. It, it's also because we have strong advocates like you. And let me tell you, because this may be helpful to others who have questions and how do you get things done. It was in part because of your stellar work in educating and making us more aware of what we needed to do to understand how important these scientific and research dollars are to make a difference in our lives with Alzheimer's and other diseases that confront us. So I think what we have to do is take that same type of work and in our delegations, we actually have delegation meetings where both sides of the aisle will talk. So I will tell you, let's work on it, and I will help you by writing a letter to encourage those, since we already have legislation there, that we can get more support. Thank you so much. Sam Burnett, and I'm a senior advocate and I would first like to thank you for a fantastic report of the third district. You did a phenomenal job. My second is a compliment to your staff. They've been very interested in helping us with senior advocation. Now my question and my response is, yesterday in the, pre state, the President's State of the Union speech, he talked about raising the minimum wage to $10 an hour. My concern is, how can you help us raise the COLA for our seniors as the cost of living goes up, we need that same kind of a raise. Thank, thank you very much for that. Uh, I also support raising the 10 plus 10, 10 dollars and 10 cent minimum wage because I think it makes a difference. And, and I think what people don't understand is it helps us on both sides of the cash register. So when you increase the dollars for people who are working, it allows them to have money to put back into the economy that grows. I think the same thing is true with making sure that we have a fair COLA for our seniors. 
One of the things that I am interested in, and I've been working with people on, and, and it's important for us to understand that so often it is so unfortunate that they take things out of the bills and the budget bills to make way, so to speak, for other things. So one of the things we're doing as we look at pensions and as we look at unemployment, we are working very hard to get legislation in that will be favorable to what you're requesting. And I will be attending those caucus meetings and being a voice for that because I am supportive of it. Thank you. Stephen Brubaker, I live in uh, Bexley, Ohio. Uh, Congressman Beatty, thanks so much for coming to district. I always look forward to seeing uh, elected officials here on the home ground, much better than DC. Uh, I'm an independent insurance agent. I've been selling health insurance for 35 years. And you can imagine what my world must be like right now. Uh, I'm, I'm one of those individuals that's responsible for enacting the Affordable Care Act. I probably meet with three to five people every day trying to explain to them off-market, on-market, all these different carriers, all these different deductibles, coinsurance, premiums, rate increases. It's pretty busy right now. And my, I'm here today to ask for your help. And all I ask is that you support the independent agents. They're down here on the ground with boots on the ground doing the heavy lifting because we need House Bill 2328 to pass or we're going to be included with the claims. And, and the agents need to be included in the future of health care or you're not going to have anybody deliver the message. That's a bipartisan bill. I would love to have your support, Congresswoman. Thank you, and that is something we have had the opportunity to meet with many insurance uh, agents uh, during my job tour, and so this is not the first time that we are hearing this, so this is something that I'll be reviewing, and I am supportive because I think here's the thing we have to understand, especially when you have something that is so broad-based as the affordable health care. Uh, we had a rocky road in starting, but here's the good news, and this is why I'll be interested in looking into being supportive uh, to you. Because when you look at the Affordable Care Act, there were 175,000 district constituents who were covered and have pre preventive insurance. And then when you look at the 1.3 million people in Ohio who have better health insurance, we can't be in a position because of independent workers who are small business owners that we don't work with them to help them. So I'd like to make sure that I have my legislative team get with you so we could work with you because I need to be all the way there, but I am on your team and it is something that I'm supportive of. Thank you. Hey, my name is Sean Fettaplace, and I actually live in those two buildings right over there. I can see out the window uh, in the district. And my question was, there's a lot of misconceptions about Social Security. I actually work with a number of volunteers. Sam's one of our volunteers. And we actually met with some of your staff previously. And I just want to first off say thank you very much for your support for these programs. There's a misconception, though, that they're going broke or that they're going bankrupt or whatever the case might be, which is not true. Social Security has enough money to run until 2034 with no changes, and even after that, it can still pay out most of benefits. That said, there's eventually <coughs> going to become an issue of fiscal solvency, and there's a lot of folks who want to cut benefits to make up for that shortfall. But there's other folks, such as our organization, the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare, that believes that raising the cap or even eliminating in totally, and for folks who don't know, you pay up to $113,000 per year in FICA tax, Social Security tax. After that, you pay nothing. So there's a lot of people who believe that by raising that, you can help make up for that shortfall. I'm just wondering if that's something that you might be willing to support uh, in a hypothetical scenario, if there was some type of agreement, or if you would be willing to cut uh, some benefits to help make up for the eventual deficit. First, let me just say thank you uh, for meeting with my staff and thank you for the work that you all do. Uh, this is a topic that is very dear to me. And so I'm, I'm going to start with the answer here by saying uh, I am a proponent 
of not doing anything that hurts Social Security and Medicare for our seniors and the people who have made an investment and worked so long to be in the system, and now we're giving back to them. Now, with that said, as you know that, as, as you know, and, and firsthand on the advocacy side, that there are tons of plans out there where they want to look at adjusting the age and taking it up. So what I'd like to say is I need to look at the total plan, and I think that's the major reason you have not seen the enactment move further uh, on the House floor because there's, there are plans that combine all of the things. There are plans that are absent of the things. So what I am interested in doing is having a bipartisan solution that does not affect our seniors and take away their Social Security. Because I will not support a bill that affects our Social Security or Medicare for our seniors. I'm sorry. But thank you for your work. Uh, thank you. Next Good question. afternoon, Congresswoman Beatty. Cornelius McGrady, Reynoldsburg City Council. I'm excited about, I'm excited to hear the initiative that you're proposing towards within council, the Bring Missing Children Home Act. I'm just so excited. I, I can't wait to hear more information about this um, as I shared with you. And there's so much work out there to be done. Can you share what goals and objectives that are within the act that you're looking to propose? And what can we do as constituents to assist you in the passage of that act that you bring forward? Thank you so much. And, and one of the reasons that I highlighted this piece of legislation is for that reason. We need all the support we can get. I was so impressed with you coming to our press conference and taking the time to share with us all of the training that you've been doing for years. Uh, the same way with the organization that's here. And, and by the way, I wanted to say to them, this was covered up, but I'm wearing the band. I am aware. So part of what we're doing tonight in announcing it so we can build this coalition. But there are some legislative things that we have to do first. And first of all, what's so horrible about what we have now, let's take a, a young girl that's 10 years old and she's been pushed into the child sex trafficking. Well, the way the laws are written now, it constitutes her as a child prostitution. So the first thing I'm not going to allow is for our young children who are kidnapped, who are taken and oftentimes raped to be the victims in this. So that's the first thing to the law. So we are also working with the police to make sure that we're on the same page. So we are bringing them into the fold. So the first part is to get the bill passed with the change in the laws so we can then bring in our not-for-profit organizations and build this whole coalition so we can do education and awareness that you're doing, that Darlena Jones and others are doing. So we're starting on boots on the ground, and I think we've done well tonight, and then we're going to take the first steps of correcting the language in the law, and then we'll take it from there. But we're, we're open to suggestions and ideas. Okay, thank you. Next question. I'll follow up with your staff. Hi, I'm John Schmall from Columbus, and mental health counselors and marriage and family therapists comprise about 40% of the behavioral health workforce. And veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan and veterans of other wars are committing suicide at an exceptionally high rate compared with the national average. These counselors have a strong desire to serve veterans and their families, but they encounter numerous barriers to VA employment. The VA now employs fewer than 200 providers from these two professional groups among the behavioral health force of over 23,000. Two bills have been submitted before Congress to help increase mental health counseling hiring within the VA. But what else can Congress do to break down the barriers and have the VA hire more mental health counselors and marriage and family therapists to help veterans and their families 
and help lower the high suicide rate? First, let me just uh, say thank you. Uh, that is a major focus in our office. So let me give you a two-part answer and first say that we actually have a veteran in our district office that is working with us. And it has been very helpful to me to help me be more educated on first Members of Congress need to learn more about the Veteran Services Office. I'm very fortunate. My chief of staff was also the chief for the Veteran Services Committee. So early on, when I came to Congress and hired her, she started explaining to me the value of having social workers and the value of going in and taking the data and the information that you get from your veterans and pinning a letter. So not only did we pin the letter, I went and had a morning breakfast with the Secretary of Veterans Affairs, Secretary Shinseki and shared with him that it was a two-fold problem. They needed more employees, but what we actually found out was their records aren't even online. So they were gonna take the next year, which would be this year, from last year to the end of this year, and look at getting their records automated and then bringing in folks who would be able to, one, speed up the process of even knowing what the problems are so you can get the treatment. We've also worked with our regional office to make sure on the benefit side and the healthcare side that those veterans who are experiencing some behavioral issues will be able to go to the head of the line because the problem is we're not getting, we're not identifying them, getting them into the system and treating them soon enough. And I can assure you, I'm one of your biggest advocates for making sure my father was a veteran. And I know the time that men and women uh, have taken to make sure that our lives are freer. And in my freshman class, I served with Tammy Duckworth, uh, a veteran and someone who served and lost both of her legs. And every day she sits with us on the congressional floor fighting for those who have been injured injured, or those who have had some behavioral difficulties. So we will make sure if you leave your card and the piece of paper you have, we will stay in personal contact with you. Good evening, Congresswoman Beatty. My name is India Adams and I attend Eastmore Academy. I'm a junior there. My school is of Columbus City Schools and um, we were just wondering if you would be willing to hold a meeting about human trafficking from a student's perspective, like with some of the students in our group perhaps, something like a student forum. Sounds like you've just given me my next town hall. <laughs> we're holding a student town hall on sexual trafficking. Absolutely. L let me just say this. This is what this is about. How old are you, if you don't mind? I'm 17 years old. Here's a 17-year-old child that understands it after being in this room for one hour, how they can be supportive and help. We owe it to you. I have an obligation. So thank you for asking. And just like I'm going to Chris Street School, we're having a town forum on sexual trafficking where we will bring you in. The only thing I'm asking you to do, wear those orange shirts for me. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Hi, my name is Isaac Khan. I'm a senior at Reynoldsburg High School ESIM Academy. And first of all, um, I'm in charge of the robotics team over there. And I would like to personally invite you to come watch us during our build season until February 18th. Anytime, it would be a great pleasure to have you over there. And my question is, being a senior about to go to college, how does my future look for how I'm going to pay for my college education? L let me just say, thank you. I understand this firsthand. One of the early things when I was uh, in Congress last year came up the whole thing about the interest rates. It went from 3.4% to 6.8%. I was one of the first individuals to stand up on the House floor as a freshman and new to Congress, but what I did know, it was not right for our young folks or their parents to be able to absorb that type of unsustainable debt 
by getting an education. So there were lots of us that used our voice, and the good news is that we were able to lower the interest rates and put a cap on them and sustain them, but it is only a temporary fix. So this is why we need to make sure that we bring both sides of the aisle together. So I think your voice, writing letters as a student and telling your story, and I can tell you, because it's been a little while since I had college tuition, but my niece wrote a letter to my husband and I the other day saying she wanted to go to college, and she had gotten a couple scholarships. But she also said there was another college she went to. And I looked at my husband and said, wonder how much tuition is now. Maybe we could pay it. And then I looked at the school she wanted to go to, and we actually had to bring out a pen and paper because we kept saying that could not be right for one year. That's not the end of the story. I was only looking at the tuition. And then I said, is there something separate for room and board? And then we put in room and board, and another $23,000 came up. And then all of these required services came up to a grand total of almost $50,000 for one year for this 17-year-old child to go to college. It's unthinkable. So I am with you. We need to engage, as we heard in the president's speech the other day, talking about getting corporate America engaged to hire people. We need to make sure that we get everyone engaged to make sure that after we get our children out of high school and we encourage them to work hard and we tell them that they live in this wonderful, wealthy country and then they can't afford to go to college, something is wrong with that picture and you will hear this voice saying that repeatedly on the U.S. Congress floor. Thank you for your question. Next question. Hi, my name is Andrea Courtois. I'm from Columbus, Ohio. Um, I love the women, when women succeed, America succeeds statement. It's probably the truest statement you could say in some ways. But I was wondering if you could expand on what programs and policies are under that and how you're trying to move women forward in America today. Yes, thank you so much. When this first came up, a group of women on the U.S. Congress floor led by uh, our leader decided that it needed to be more, just, more than just a saying. So we put it three components in it. The first, obviously, is to empower women. So then you start thinking, what are the things you can do to empower women? So then we start thinking about women who have children and want to stay home but do other things, women who have children and want to go back to work, like my, grand, like my grandchild's mother, who is a common pleas judge. So we thought we needed to have child care. It's one of the things that we come together for to advocate for. And then we needed to have economic development and jobs. But then our biggest thing was we need to have mentors. And I was so excited because I know what that means because we have a group of ladies on this first row right here that for more than three years have championed a Columbus school, the Columbus Preparatory School for Girls, and it has made a difference in their lives. And that's one of the things about when you talk about when women succeed, America succeeds. So it's those three components that we start with. It is new, so we don't have any established curriculum. So what I did a month ago was we kind of tested it. So we invited women to come and talk, and women across diverse backgrounds and ethnicities came and talked about those components. And it was a day when it was as cold as today is, but it was also snowing inches, and we filled that room with women holding up signs saying, when women succeed, America succeeds. And now that the president of these United States said it in his State of the Union, all types of Facebooks, Everybody's website is carrying that label. I just wish they could say he said it because Joyce Beatty asked him to say it. So once again, if you leave your name, because we, we don't have an exact date, but it will be this summer, 
and we know we're going to do it on a Thursday on the grounds at the King Arts Complex because of security reasons, accommodations. They already do a program there in the summer that accommodates about 3,500 people. So we're going to piggyback on that because they've been successful in doing it. And so we're not going to reinvent the wheel. So we'll make sure we give you information and keep you informed. The Congresswoman will take a couple more questions. She has time for two more questions. Okay, thank you. We'll take one from each microphone, if that can be fair. Okay. Hi, I'm Shannon Schlagbaum. I'm from Columbus, and I'm a member of Bread for the World, um, a faith-based organization that advocates for people who are hungry, both nationally and internationally. And um, I met with your staff in DC this summer and have been in contact with them throughout the year. And I really just wanted to say thank you so much for all of your support for hunger-based programs such as WIC and SNAP and International Food Aid and free school meals. Thank well, you very much. Well, thank you so much for coming and sharing. And, and it always means a lot to me uh, when people tell me uh, about the staff and that they're helping them because that is the model in our office. Uh, they will tell you, I won't ask them to do anything that I wouldn't do. And when it comes to work, I do just about everything. So thank you for that. Okay, we have one last question over here. Um, hello, my name is Meg Idiasathang. A little louder. My name is Meg Idiasathang. I am. Uh, I go to Roseburg High School, the East Stem, East Stem Academy, and I'd like to first start off by thanking you for recognizing us. And um, as part, since I've been in East Stem for three years, and I've realized this is a really great opportunity for kids to accelerate their schoolwork and get them ready for college. I was just wondering, how do you plan on? expanding it all over the country, the STEM programs? Well, one of the things I think is that we, we start right, in, right here in Ohio. And Ohio is a big STEM school state. And you may not know it, but we're the seventh largest state in the United States. And right here in the Columbus, Ohio, which I'm going to use it in the collective uh, term with our surrounding communities, we're the fifth, 15th largest city. And so we have become a national model. So I think one of the things we need to do, just as you're talking about STEM and E-STEM, maybe when we have that congressional day that we have your school and other schools see how many schools you can get in our STEM community, and we'll match it with corporations. And then we'll pull in some of our recipients, like the Columbus Urban League. We have executive staff here. And so let's think about how we can work together, because STEM and financial literacy and all of those types of programs make a difference in your lives and young folks when they go ahead and go to college. So let's put a team of students together, and I know we'll get it done. Thank you. And we have one more person. I, you have to realize, I can't see from up here, okay. but they're motioning me. So whatever it is, the answer is yes. Hi. Um, to my, you asking the question. Yes. My name is Cassandra Crawford, and this is my daughter, Sydney Crawford. I'm the proud parent of a dyslexic student. Um, in the state of Ohio here, um, if your child is autistic, uh, it's one out of six, and there are a lot of resources out there available to help. If your child is dyslexic, I call it the uh, invisible disorder because you would look and you would uh, see that there, there's nothing vis visibly wrong. Um, but can you imagine going to a restaurant and not being able to read the menu or going to pay and not being able to figure out the change or not being able to, um, or to be able to tell time? And this is my daughter, Sydney. In the, in the city of Columbus right now, there's only one school, it's called Malburn Academy, that can really uh, assist her. And uh, the reason why we're here is, and I'm gonna let Sydney speak, is that, especially in the African American community, I'm on the board for uh, the Dyslexic Association. The resources are just not, people aren't aware of what the stages are, how to help people with dyslexia, 
And so that's what Sydney's here today, just to say that you know children who have dyslexic, who dyslexia have high IQs, they're viable. And as a parent, as a proud parent, I just want the same right that any child would have to be able to go to the school of her choice and to be able to have the career of her choice. In order to do that now, it requires great sacrifice to go to a school like Auburn. So I'm going to put Sydney on. Thank you, Sydney. Um, my name is Sydney, and sometimes it is very challenging to do things that maybe some other ki kids can't do. Sydney, let me, let me say this to you and, and your mother. I understand this probably far better than you realize. When I was coming up, I was always a, a great orator, but there were sometimes I would have difficulty, and they didn't know what dyslexia was at, at that time. So I probably had some small form of it because there was a teacher who said, this gifted child needs to just slow down a little bit because I would see words that weren't there. And then there would be words that were there, and I would call them other words. But there was somebody like your mother, because we didn't have teachers, and our parents didn't know anything about this. And it was a lady that sat down with me, and for the longest time, I would have to take every finger and put it in every word and say it very slowly. And over the years, I'm one of the lucky ones. It was better. But I have been so touched by you waiting to stand here and more impressed that your mother let you ask the question and the courage that it took to put those words together and stay, stay, stand there and say this, let me see if I can go one better for you. So often pieces of legislation, whether it's awareness, whether it's funding, they get their start because some brave child or person stands up and thus we get a Megan Law. Thus we get an Amber Alert. My first year, my first inaugural state of the district, let me say this to you. I'm gonna write a resolution and we're gonna call it the Sydney Resolution. So I want your mother to give my staff, it's gonna get better, Sydney. It just takes somebody believing in you and having a little bit of hope. And there were a lot of people that had a whole lot of belief and hope in me that I didn't know. So it gets a little better. When we go back to Congress, I'm gonna have it put in the congressional records. And we're gonna call your mother, we're gonna tell everybody in here to watch it on TV because I'm gonna announce it during the floor session and we're gonna talk about the Sydney resolution. Now all my staff is over here scrambling and 50% of them are lawyers. So we're gonna figure it out, but you stay after and you give all your information and that's our first step. And hopefully that will give the world courage that they will all know that there's a little Sydney out there that's a fireball. I am so glad you were my last person because it truly was the best for me. Thank you all, Godspeed, and this has been a wonderful, wonderful evening for me. We get photos, okay. You need to see. I